And I'm, I'm going, how? How can I help you as a young adult to know that perhaps a decision that you make this week completely change the direction of your life. Because that's what happened for me. I sat at a conference just like this, went to camp just like you went to. And for the first time in my life, sitting in a conference just like this, I said, I want to know Christ. I heard a pastor preach a sermon like what you just heard. And I said, I want to know Christ. And I sat there probably much like you're sitting here tonight thinking, I don't really fit in with everybody else here. I mean, every, everyone else, they're doing things different than I'm doing. And I, I heard a sermon about how God had a specific purpose for my life. And I remember being junior high at a conference like this, making a decision that completely changed the direction that God would take my life. And I'm sitting on the front row and I'm going, how can I help you see that? Exodus chapter 13 and verse number 17 is three verses we're going to read. This is the Lord bringing the children of Israel out of bondage. They're coming out of Egypt. They're headed to the promised land. But before they cross the Red Sea, there's this event that's recorded in chapter 13. Now, if you're not, if you're not careful, you just read right through the Bible because, you know, you have to get a certain amount of Bible reading done in order to check off the checkbox for your Bible reading throughout the year. And when you just blaze through the scripture like that, you miss unbelievable, powerful lessons that the Lord has for us. Amen. Look at verse 13. Or, or look at chapter 13, verse 17. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, God led them not. If you mark in your Bibles, you should mark that phrase. God led them not. Not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. That was, look here, that was closer. That, that was a quicker route. That was shorter mileage. That was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent, they, 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 they turn around. That's the word repent here. They turn around. They go the other way. When they see war and they return to Egypt. V verse 18, but God led the people about. So verse 17, God did not lead them this way. And instead, God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. So, so instead of going directly across the, the quicker route, they, they went down and they went a completely different way. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. They ended up in a cul-de-sac. They, they, they found themselves trapped by what was an impassable sea, an immovable mountain, and this invincible army that's going to come blazing down behind them. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use your word in our lives. Father, give me what I stand in need of this evening. Father, and I pray that you would do the same for every person in this room. 
Father, there are hundreds of needs represented, and you know every one of them. You can answer every one of them. I cannot. So hide me behind your word. Fill me with your spirit. And I pray that you would do the same for all that listen this evening. Father, that we, although we have ears, that we would hear what the Spirit saith to us. And that at the end, we would be obedient to your call. We ask all these things according to the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And by his name we pray. And all the church said together, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for standing. You may be seated. I love passages like this because passages like the one that we just read... Help us to realize that with God, there are no accidents. That God has determined everything about your life. That God has set for you a purpose, a plan, a direction. And all that God is doing in your life and all that God has done in your life is serving this purpose. It's serving this plan. It's God leading you along the way that he intends for you to go. And God has a purpose for all that has happened to you and God has a purpose for all that is happening to you. And more than that, God has a purpose for all that will happen to you. There are no accidents in your life with God. None of it takes God by surprise. You say, well, well, well Dave, why, why is God doing that? Why is God purposing and guiding and directing? And this is, this is, this is the reason. Because he wants you and he wants me to follow him. He wants us to go after him. And so he uses passages like this to, to show us a way in which he operated in the past so that it provides encouragement for us in the present to, to trust him, to press into him, to pursue him. To forsake all, deny ourselves, and go strong after him in this way. You and I are not here by coincidence. You didn't, you didn't come to this conference by, by accident. I, I, I didn't wind up here just by chance. The, the scripture would have us to understand that all the things that are happening in our life, God is orchestrating them for our good. He's taking the events of our life and he is orchestrating them. He's working them into our lives for our own good. He's not saying that all the events of our life are good. It's saying that God takes events that were evil and bad. And God is so powerful and God is so miraculous and God is so great that he can take those things which were meant for evil and he can use them for good in us. Because verse 29 of Romans 8, because it conforms us, it shapes us, it pushes us, it molds us into the image of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And anything that makes you like Jesus is good. Do you hear me? Anything that makes you like Jesus is a good thing for you. This is what's happening in the text. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, has allowed the Israelites, he's allowed the Hebrews to go free. They were, they were slaves. The plagues come onto Egypt because Pharaoh is much like you and I, very stubborn. And so he refuses to let the children of Israel go. And so God brings these, what we call the, the plagues. The scriptures call them judgments and signs. It didn't have to go this way. If Pharaoh would have just followed the word of the Lord, it wouldn't have played out that way. And yet he stubbornly rejected the way and the word of God. And as a result, these plagues rain down on Egypt. And finally, Pharaoh says, I've had enough. Take, go, get out. I never want to see you again. And so now they're on their way to a land that they've never been. The promised land. 
Pharaoh will have a change of heart. That's chapter number 14. Chapter 14 and verse number 5, Pharaoh's going to say to his military commanders, why have we done this thing? Why have we let them go? They were the driving force of our economy. Now we're the ones that have to do all the work. And so Pharaoh calls for 600 chariots and they go hard after the Hebrews because they think that the Hebrews are lost. Because surely they would have taken the short route and they would have gotten right over into the wilderness, headed to the promised land, and they wouldn't have gone down and around. Surely, fair, surely Moses would have listened to Sipporah when she said, I know a faster route. But Moses said, no, I'm going to listen to God. And Pharaoh loads up all of his chariots. These are modern day like tanks and, and cruisers and destroyers and stealth bombs. And they come and they, they box in the children of Israel. In verse number 11 and verse number 12 of chapter 14, the children of Israel see this. And here's what they say. Look at verse 11. And they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So here's what they do when they find themselves in a difficult spot. They go, We are going to die. That was exactly their response. It would have been better if we stayed in Egypt. It was much better off for us when we were living like slaves. Have you ever noticed this? Have you ever noticed that when things don't go our way or when things don't go the way that we think they should go, we are only presented with the most extreme positions? You would think that the people who have just seen the Lord bring the ten plagues down onto the Egyptians, that you think they would go, well, maybe God has an eleventh plague and he's going to stop them somehow. And yet read the text. There's no, there's no thought in the, in the, in, in the Israelites' mind in, in any way that God is going to provide for us. He's not even factored into the equation. He's not even factored into the equation. And so they're trapped between this invincible army, this, this apparently unmovable sea, and this impassable mountain. And now they're wondering, did God mess up? Did God make a mistake? Did God give us the wrong direction? And see, they're, and they're faced with the same proposition that you and I are faced with. Is God in control or not? Did God put you in the wrong family? Did God place you in the wrong church? Did God, did God allow you to be born in the wrong city? Did, did God bring you into the wrong time? Did God shape and mold you and fashion you and make you incorrectly? Was God's plan for you and God's purpose for you, was it somehow, was it somehow incorrect? That when God made you, he messed up? There's three lessons here I want you to see. Three lessons I want you to see. First, God knows exactly what he's doing. Look here. God knows exactly what he is doing. Look, look at the person next to you. Look at the person next to you. Look at the person next to you. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. Tell him, God knows exactly what he's doing. Do it. Do it. Okay, look here. You may not know why God made you like that, you may not know why God made her like that. You may not know why God made him like that. But this is what you need to know. God knows exactly what he is doing. There's never been a moment in all of history where God has not known exactly what he is doing. 
There's never been one moment of one second of all of recorded history where God has in some way not known exactly what he's doing. Look at verse 17. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. You see that? So, so this people who are weak and frail and scared, this people who've lived 400 years in slavery, had they seen the Philistines, had they seen the people of war, had they seen the devastation of war, they would have turned around and they would have went right back into Egypt. And God knew that. And so what God did is God took them the long way around. Because God knows exactly what he's doing. God took them the long road of mercy because God knows exactly what he's doing. And when God made you, God knew exactly what he was doing. And when God put you in that family, he knew exactly what he was doing. And when God gave you those parents, he knew exactly what he was doing. And when God put you in this city, he knew exactly what he was doing. I want you to think of this. Think of it this evening. That everything that God is doing in your life, he is doing for a purpose. He created you for a purpose. He, he built you and wired you for a purpose. He gave you life for a purpose. He gives you breath for a purpose. He gives you a family and he gives you a church and he gives you friends and he does all of these things for a purpose. God knows exactly what he is doing. You see, and the reason, the reason this is so important is because the whole world keeps telling you a lie, and that lie is that everything around you is an accident. That everything in this world is random, that we just showed up here. That we're just here by chance, we're here by circumstance. I, I know that this is what the world teaches. The world teaches you this in a variety of ways. It's some of them subtle and some of them not so subtle. I remember when my oldest son, Gabriel, is a freshman in college now. I have six kids. I have a freshman in college and we have one in diapers. I got the whole gamut all the way through. So I remember when Gabriel was little, we'd watch these shows on Discovery Channel or National Geographic Channel or History Channel, and they'd come on and they'd go, billions and billions of years ago. And I'd push the mute button, I'd say, Gabriel, that's not true. And so Gabriel would go, that's a lie. He'd start screaming that. It's probably this big. Whenever, billions of, that's a lie. So we're on a field trip to the IMAX one day. We go in the IMAX, we sit down, up pops this screen and here are all these stars and creation and planets and they're all circling around and the narrator comes on and he goes, billions of years ago. And sitting in the middle of IMAX, Gabriel goes, that's a lie. <laughs> so people are looking, we should, that's a lie. Say it like that. <laughs> the world teaches you you're an accident. The world, teaches, the world teaches us we're here by accident, that we're sitting on a ball that is spinning at a thousand miles an hour, and that got here by an accident. Do you think about that for a second? That don't make any sense. That's not normal. That we're sitting on a, on a ball of water spinning at a thousand miles a second, and that at the center of the ball of water is a ball of fire. So it's a ball of fire surrounded by a ball of water, and it's not spilling, it's not running out, and it's spinning a thousand miles a second. That's just normal, it just got here. It just showed up. It's here by accident. No. It, it, this spinning ball of water surrounding a, a, a ball of fire is circling a much larger ball of fire, like a million times larger than, than, than our ball, and we're circling it at like 67,000 miles an hour. 
So it's a really big ball and we're circling it and then we're spinning and we're just supposed to think that got here by accident. Just one day, just boop, out popped this ball of water surrounding a ball of fire circling a much larger ball of fire. That's how we showed up here. No. No. It takes more faith to believe that than to believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The whole world is screaming at you. You're here by accident. It's just happenstance. It's just a mistake. Like, like we started, we learned how to talk by mistake. You thought about that? Now, sometimes some people talk so much that it's a mistake, honestly. And you know who you are. You're the talker in the youth group. But, but we're supposed to think, oh, well, we just, we advanced much rapidly and we just, you know, we started making guttural sounds one day. We were like this little flopping lizard and we just started making guttural sounds. And then out of the guttural sounds came vocal cords. And then out of these guttural, like every, all the, all the lizard people were just going, rah, rah. and then one day one of them went, hi. <laughs> you, how'd you do that? It's just by accident. That's what we're supposed to think. This is the whole world tells us we're just here by accident. Like taste buds on the back of your tongue, they're there by accident. Do you think about how amazing it is that God gave you taste buds? Hey, imagine if everything tastes like green beans. That would be a terrible life. You sit down, it's a bowl of like Lucky Charms. It's got sugar everywhere, the milk. It just looks so delicious. You dig in and you just put it in and it tastes like just like green beans. You would never want to eat again. But we have taste buds. And we're supposed to think they're just... You know, one day we were just eating nothing like what's back here, but we were eating, we're just foraging around in this field, and all of a sudden, on the back of our tongue, boop, popped a taste bud, and one dude went, oh, oh, that was spicy, hey, hey, hey that was spicy. That, that's how it happened. It's just by accident. We, we, we're taught that we learned to laugh by accident. How, how many of you, you're a snorter when you laugh? When you really get going, out comes this like, right? Point, point at the snorter in the youth group right now. Just point, point at them, right? Isn't it great? And one of my children, they're, they're a snorter. I mean, they get laughing, and they're laughing and laughing, and all of a sudden in the middle, they're like, ah, it's so funny. And now everyone else in the family is just laughing at them. Like, we're not even laughing at the joke anymore. She's laughing at them. I mean, some people laugh like, you, say, you ever been sitting in church and you see something funny and you know you're not supposed to laugh in church? And, and, and how, why is it that when you're not supposed to laugh, you really want to laugh? Why is that? So you're sitting in church and you're just holding this in and you're like, <laughs> you thought about that? That's a great sound. Like, <laughs> make no eye contact and the more you don't make eye contact the more you want to laugh you ever felt like that how many of you get can I get a witness on that point right there you were doing some of that just a little while ago I saw some of you <coughs> some, some people some people snore when they laugh they do this like <coughs> some people like <coughs> when they laugh it's a fantastic and we're told all of that all of the, the laughter, the talking, the taste buds, all of that, it's just an accident. It's not on purpose. No, 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 no. That's God in his mercy knowing exactly what he's doing when he made you. God knows what he's doing. Now, all of these all of these are not accidents. All of these are evidences that God knows what he is doing. And God operates toward us in ways that are kind and gracious. 
And God operates toward us in gracious ways every single day. So, so, watch, so much so that they are a part of our everyday experience. And we, we very seldom slow down enough to go, thank you, God, for allowing me to taste food of different kinds. And thank you, God, for, for providing for me this gift of talking and laughter and speech. And it, thank you, God, for knowing exactly what you were doing when you made me. There's everything about you. God knows. And nothing about you is an accident. Nothing about you is an accident. It's amazing because you can back up in the story of Exodus and God comes to Moses and God says to Moses, I've got a purpose for you, Moses. I've got something I want you to do. And what you'll find in the story of Exodus is you'll find God over, or you'll find Moses rather, over and over and over in the story going, no, no, no I can't do it. I, 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 me no talk good. I can't do that. And God going, no, 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 no. I, I, I built you. I made you. I know you. I know exactly what I'm doing when I call you. This is an evidence of God's goodness in our lives. Friend, have you thought of this? Is it possible that with everything that you see, with everything that you know, is it possible that you don't know as much as God knows? I, I, I get it, you know a lot. But is it possible that with everything that you know, Everything that you know that you want from life, everything that you know about life, is it possible that you don't know everything that God knows? See, look at the text. God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. That, that, that certainly would have been far more prudent. That, that would have been far more convenient. No, but God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return. This is, this is God allowing us to realize all of the counterfactuals in our life. So, so counterfactuals, those are, um, those are the what ifs. What if I had been on that plane? What if I would have been born to a different family? What, what if I would have gotten in that car? What if I had different parents? What if I were born in a different country? It's all of the what ifs. What if I hadn't gone to that school? What if I hadn't married that person? What if... It, what this passage is showing you is all those counterfactuals, all of those what if questions that you have. All of those counterfactuals are God's mercy in guiding you to where he wants you to be in this moment right now. I think sometimes it's difficult for us to see this. Especially those of us who've been raised in good godly families with parents who weren't perfect but who tried. Who've been given, who've been given the advantages of growing up in church, attending conferences like this. You know how rare this is? I know you think that everyone, I know you think everyone does this because everyone in your circle, everyone in the circle of your life does this, but everyone doesn't do this. Have you ever stopped for a moment and considered that? I'm thankful to God every day of my life that I didn't have a, have a dad who was hiding pornographic images somewhere in the house. You know, most young men that I talk to who have addiction in this area, they say, it started when I found my dad's phone, or I looked at my dad's computer, or 
I saw something under my dad's bed. I thank the Lord every day of my life that I never had that. I thank God, I thank God that I, had, I didn't have anyone in my life at a young age who offered me drugs or alcohol. I thank God for that. I thank the Lord for all of the, all of the what ifs that never happened in my life. I'm thankful to God I never saw my parents yell at each other. I'm thankful to God I never saw my dad hit my mom. I never saw my mom hit my dad. That would have been a funny sight. I'm thankful to God every day for a thousand things just like that that were for me. I'm not going to lead you through the, through the land of the Philistines in the way of war because you'll turn around and you'll go back. And sometimes for those of us who've had the benefit of a Christian family, we kind of think, oh, well, my story is so boring compared to that guy who was a drug dealer at the age of seven, a terrorist. He had a neck tattoo by the age of nine. And then he gets saved. And he has this amazing story. And I go, well, I, that was boring. I'm afraid of needles. I don't really even handle Advil real well. My, I get sick with that. I wish I had a story like that. And here's what I'm telling you. Every, every parent, every parent in the world is going, no, 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 no. We want, we want that for you, not that for you. E e even, even the mom and dad who grew up like that are going, no, 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 you don't want, that's what we want for you. And if that's you, if you've been given something like that, and you ought to take the time to stop and thank God for that. That you never went through the, the land of the Philistines. You never saw the men of war. And God knew exactly what he was doing when he led you the way he led you. When he placed you where he placed you. When he gave you the parents that he did. When he put you in the church that you have. And God knew exactly in that moment what he was doing. And for some of you, you have seen some of those things. And you ought to commit this week to say, you know what, my kids are going to grow up different than that. They're not going to, they're going to see mom and dad fight. They're not going to witness these things. They're not going to be exposed to these kind of things at a young age. I'm going to commit this week to make sure that the trajectory of my life, the direction of my life is going to go altogether different God knows exactly what he is doing. And none of the things that God has done for you and with you and in you are by accident. That's the first thought. And there's a second thought in the text, though. That God knows, first, exactly what he is doing. But second, God sees exactly where he wants you to be. That's really verse 18. Look at the verse. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. That word harness is literally trapped. They went up boxed in. That's, that's really the idea. Th this wasn't, look, this wasn't a, oops, we took a wrong turn moment. That's not what this was. 
This was God seeing exactly where he wanted the children of Israel to go. And where did he want them to go? Where did he want them to end up? He wanted them to end up at a cul-de-sac, at a dead end, with an impassable sea, an immovable mountain, and an invincible army breathing down their neck. That's exactly where he wanted them. Do you know why? Here's why. It's Psalms chapter 77, verse number 19. Psalm 77 is God helping us understand what happened in the Exodus. And here's what it says in verse 19 of Psalm 77. Thy way is in the sea, and thy path is in great waters and thy footsteps are not known. Do you see that? Where, where's God's way? It's in the sea. Yeah, yeah but what, what's the direction of God's path? It's, it's out in deep water. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but how do I just follow in his steps? No, his steps, they're not known. You see that? You see, God's entire purpose for you and for me, everything that God is doing in our lives is for the point of delivering us from our self-sufficiency. We think we got it all together. I know best on how my life should go, and it would be nice if God would consult with me every now and then about the way things should go in my life. That's how we think. And yet this passage shows us, no, no, no. God sees exactly where he wants you to be. When you and I pretend to be self-sufficient, we short-circuit God's power in our life. When you and I pretend to be self-sufficient, we short-circuit God's power in our... When we pretend like we got it all together, that our strength is enough, that our wisdom is enough, that our creativity is enough, that our might is enough, when we pretend that we've got it all together, we short-circuit God's power in our life. No, no, it's when we're weak that God is strong. It's when we realize just how foolish we really are that God shows himself to be wise. It's when we realize just how small and insignificant and tiny we are that God can demonstrate how big and awesome and how strong he is. He desires to flex his muscles for us. And yet so many times we go, no, 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 I got this, God. You just sit back and watch me work for a second. When we pretend that we're self-sufficient, we short-circuit God's power in our life. So ev watch, so everything God's doing in you is to get you to realize you aren't enough, but He is. Everything God is doing in you is to get you to realize just how small you are, but how big He is. So yes, God knows exactly what he's doing and you're not here by accident before a purpose, but God also knows that we are stubborn people who really like the thought of doing things our own way. And so God has to bring us time and time again to cul-de-sacs in this life. He has to sit us down in a way where we're harnessed up where all we have in front of us is an impassable sea and all we have beside us is an immovable mountain and all we have coming down behind us is this invincible army to get us to go, God, I need you right now. I told you we have, we have six kids. My oldest is in college. Our youngest is six months old. I'm supposed to know that. Five months old. Our fifth is actually our first foster kid. Her name is Emery. I'll probably show you a picture of her tomorrow. She's a beautiful little baby. She came to us 
about a year and a half ago now. She came addicted to all kinds of medicine. She was way too small. Her father has a terrible story. He's in prison. Her mother gave birth to her. Then the day that gave birth to her walked out of the hospital. Has never called, has never even checked on her. And Emory came to us. She was so tiny. She was so small. I could literally hold her in one hand. And she never made a peep. The first night she was in our house, she literally slept through the whole night. She was six days old. She slept the whole night. You may not understand that, but your mom and dad would understand. Babies don't do that. Amanda woke up at five o'clock in the morning. She slapped me. She goes, the baby never got up. And I'm like, oh, baby, I go back to sleep. I have to go over to the crib for the first three months of her life, and we had to pull her mouth down, put the bottle in her mouth, and close her chin up, and we had to hold her chin closed just to teach her how to drink a bottle. Just, just how, just how weak and frail and insufficient this little baby is. Which is exactly how you and I are. It's exactly how you and I are. Emery's one and a half almost now. She thinks she is the stuff, man. She'll go, juice, that's what she wants. She wakes up in the morning, juice. She immediately points at the fridge, juice. Tart, tart, that's a pop tart. We eat those in my house because that's manna from heaven. <laughs> you say, Dave, you're not supposed to feed infants pop tarts. I don't care. It's good enough for the children of Israel. It's good enough for him. <laughs> you can't show me in the Bible that it wasn't a pop tart. Break a pop tart in half. It has blueberries in it. There's healthy stuff in there. You just break that thing in half. She'll take the pop tart. She'll lick the icing right off the front of the pop tart. She has one cup she really likes, and she has one cup she doesn't, and the cup she doesn't is a sippy cup, can't spill. The cup she loves is the one that she can spill all over herself. So she'll sit in the seat now, and you try to give her the sippy cup, and she's like, no, 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 no. You put it in the other cup, and you give it to her, and she takes it, and she immediately pours apple juice all the way down her face. This is how we are. We think, I know exactly what I need. No, 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 no. No, we really don't. I said, God knows. You're here by accident. God sees. He sees exactly where he wants you to be. But third and last, God cares. God cares about our faith response to him. There's this thing in the text that happens, and if you, if you don't slow down and think about it, you kind of just go right through it. But it's verse number 19, and here's the text. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he, it's talking about Joseph, so for Joseph had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones what, what look that was 400 years earlier god cares about your faith response to him so you aren't here by accident. Everything that God is doing, he's doing to cause you to realize just how much you need him. And then what he says is, now, I want you to believe that what I said I would do, I'll do. You can, you can understand verse number 19 is this. Promise made, 
promise kept. And so it is with God. Promise made, promise kept. 400 years before you get to Exodus 13, Joseph said, don't worry. God's going to visit you and he's going to lead you out. And when he leads you out, take my bones with you. You ever think there was a moment for the children of Israel? They were like, I don't know about this thing. I don't think we're going to get these bones out of here anytime soon. Sure. But what are you seeing displayed from Joseph? You're seeing displayed from Joseph a, a Joseph, a man who knew the word of God. He heard the word of God. He believed the word of God. And what are you seeing now in Exodus chapter 13? You're seeing a group of people who said, we know the word of God. We heard the word of God. We believed the word of God. And we will do exactly what God asks us to do. And so at the start of the conference, I'm asking you this. I'm asking you this. What's your purpose? It's true you're not here by accident. What's your purpose in this life? Are you like Moses? Are you more interested in things that you don't have instead of realizing that God made you exactly the way he wanted you to be made and God made you that way for a reason? You find yourself following the philosophy of this world, just simply comparing yourself to everybody around you, instead of recognizing that God created you individually, God made you uniquely, and God has a very special plan for you. Do you find yourself in this life going, I got this, God, I don't need your help? Or do you find yourself bringing, coming to the throne of the Lord over and over, bowing before him, recognizing just how weak you are, just how insufficient you are, and just how much you do need him? Let's bow together for prayer, shall we? And with your head bowed and with your eyes closed, Would you just in this moment think about God? Think about how God sees. Think about how God knows. Think about how God cares. Would you find yourself saying to him tonight, God, I'm open. Show me your purposes for me, and I will do it. I think sometimes we can come to events like this, weeks like this, and we can put these boundaries on God. Now, I'm going to sing some songs. I'm going to meet some friends. I'm going to have some good times. Yeah, I may make a decision here or there, and we fail to realize just how important moments like this can be. So much so that they change the direction of our lives. Our Heavenly Father, we love you. And Father, we thank you for all that you do in our lives. We thank you for your way of mercy and grace, which are new every morning in our lives. We pause at the start of this conference and we recognize that you do work in great ways in our lives. And we realize that you're even at work in our life right now. And we're asking you for the show us and we will respond in faith. We will respond in faith to you. And in Jesus' name we pray.